Okay, hello, hello and welcome. Welcome to this CSS layout workshop. Um, I've pasted a link a few times into the chat, which hopefully you can see. In fact, I'll just paste that again in case anyone new has come in, um, which is the, the starting points that we're going to be working from, so you can get that up. So I'm Rachel Andrew. Um, I'm a, a technical writer here at Google. Um, I'm also a CSS Working Group member, and I've been sort of working with and, and on CSS for, for a very long time. My own career as, as a web developer started before CSS was a thing. So um, I, I was building sites when it, when it was just HTML was what you had to, to use. So, so I've been doing CSS for a very long time. Um, and I'm generally very interested in, in layout um, as, as a subject and, and all the kind of cool new stuff that we've, we've got in layout. So that's what I'm going to go through today. We've only got 90 minutes. So it's a bit of a fly through of, of Flexbox and Grid. And, and with code examples, which, you know, if, if you're using CodePen, you can fork the examples and, and code along with me, which I think is probably the best way to learn CSS is actually to write some CSS. Um, and I'll leave the page up uh, afterwards so you can always refer back to, to the examples I was using. Um, you can ask questions here in the, in the messages. We don't have a huge amount of time for questions. So if you want to ask questions in the Discord, I've put the link um, on the page there. Uh, it means that I can go back later today and, and actually answer the questions that we, maybe we don't get time to do. So it's up to you. But if, if you want to, if you've got something that you, you'd like an answer to and we might not get to it, then if you pop it in the Discord, I shall try and get, get in there later and answer some of those questions that you have. So we'll get going, and we'll get going with the first example here, because we're going to start talking about grid. So for grid layout, um, we define a grid using a value of display. So, so grid layout is essentially a value of the display property. And we need to do that on a containing element. So here I've got in my HTML, I've got a container with, with some items. It's just a, just a bunch of divs. So on my container, which is my parent, and say display grid. Um, and that's going to give me a grid layout, although nothing is going to apparently happen straight away because we basically get a, a one column grid, uh, which looks very much like block layout. So we'll need to start creating some columns to be able to, to see anything. So we do that with the grid template columns property. And for now, let's just create some columns using uh, some pixels, nice and straightforward. So grid template columns, and I've created three column tracks. And you can see that immediately we end up getting something that looks like a grid. And the child items all move themselves into, into, that, into the place on the grid using auto placement. If you wanted some rows, you can do the same thing. So we can use grid template rows. And for now, let's just again give them a sort of fixed height. As you can see there that we've also created some rows. Um, grids are made up of grid lines. Um, they start uh, from one and at the, at the start of the grid. And that relates to the writing mode of the document. So I'm in English. So line one is on the left. If I was working in Arabic, um, which is a script that's written right to left, then line one would be on the right. So it follows the, the writing mode of the document. Now, the space between two lines is referred to as a track. So you've got column tracks and you've got row tracks. Um, we can also have gaps. Uh, if we use the gap property, And that will space out your, your tracks, essentially. Um, you can also use row gap and column gap if you want to do those individually. And the smallest section of the grid is referred to as a grid cell. And that's conceptually like a, a table cell, really. Um, it's, it's the smallest area that you've got 
on your grid. Um, another bit of terminology is we have something called the explicit grid, which is the grid that you've defined with grid template columns and grid template rows. But you'll find that if you remove the row tracks, and we saw that an issue and just did columns, you're still going to get rows. And that's because we have something called the implicit grid. Um, rather than just kind of like stacking your content up in the corner, if you say display grid and don't define rows or columns, um, grid is going to create you implicit tracks. And actually, in reality, a lot of the time, what you want to do is control the columns, but all you want is the rows to be as big as the content is, which is what you get by default because tracks are sized as auto by default. And auto, it's a bit more complex than that, but generally, you can think of it as being big enough to fit the content. Um, so if you don't define your rows, they're just going to be big enough to fit the content that you've put in. So that's the sort of basics of just creating your initial grid. Um, I've used pixels there to set out my grid, but you can use all sorts of different sizing methods. So you can use any valid length unit, which means that you could, for instance, use um, ends there and size your track that way. Um, you could use CH, which is um, roughly 15 characters. Um, so any of the, the length units that you've got in CSS, you can use those. You can also use percentages. Um, if you use a percentage, for example, 20%, that is going to be a percentage of the grid container. Um, that's, your, that's your percentage sizing. Um, percentages are also valid for the gap property. You can use percentages there. As I mentioned, you can also use auto for your track sizing. Um, and that will that will be roughly big enough um, to fit the content. Uh, the thing about auto size tracks is they will stretch by default. So if we set our final track there to auto, and there's some extra space in the grid container, you can see how it gets big and it stretches actually past the size of the content because it's just taking up all of the space. Um, only auto tracks will do will do that of the sort of standard. Um, sort of track sizing. Um, the others, if you say 150 pixels, you'll get 150 pixels. It won't stretch out to fill up any spare space. If you say auto, it will use as much space as it needs to lay out the content, but if there's some spare space left over, it will stretch and fill it. An auto is um, essentially a kind of intrinsic sizing. And what we mean by intrinsic sizing is sizing that looks at the content and works out how big it needs to be. Um, whereas all the other kinds of sizing, the length units and so on, we refer to as extrinsic sizing, as in you've defined the size and you have, you're going to fit your content into it. Um, um, intrinsic sizing actually says, well, I want this to be big enough to, to fit my content. So as well as auto, uh, you'll find there are some keywords that we can use in um, grid layout, which actually sort of use this intrinsic sizing um, and also kind of expose a bit how it works. So the first of those is min content. So if I create three tracks of min content size, you can see how min content behaves. Um, the track that's got the, you know, the, the, the seller that's got a lot of content in it, it's compressed down and what it's done is it's got as small as it possibly can do without causing any overflow uh, which means that it's taking all of the soft wrapping opportunities it's got and and getting as, as small as it can but nothing's poking out of the box and so that's that tracks min content size that's as small as it can possibly be so we have the the sort of reverse of that which is max content so if we make our tracks max content sized Can see what happens there. So our, our uh, cell here that's got a lot of content in, it's stretched out and it's it's gone as long as it can, but no bigger. It's not like when I used auto and it's stretched bigger than the size of the content. It's just gone to the size of the content. Now that would happen even if there wasn't enough space for it to do that. So it could cause an overflow, for example. Um, if you had you know a long paragraph in there, it would just keep on unraveling um, and would eventually cause a scroll bar um, or break out of your box or what have you. But that's the max content size. Um, 
And that's kind of important to understand because although we can use these keywords um, as sizing, you know, within Grid, they're also how Grid and also Flexbox kind of work at how big things are. They look at what's the smallest size it can be and what's the biggest size it can be and then make decisions about how to lay out your content based on those two things. So it's kind of, they're kind of useful, um, useful sort of um, keywords to understand um, because they expose something about, about CSS and how sizing is calculated. Um, but a very useful keyword which uses this, this um, intrinsic sizing is fit content. And what fit content does is we pass in a value, so a length unit. Um, so if we create three tracks using fit content 10M, you can see that the first two tracks have just gone to their max content size. They've not gone to 10M because they don't need 10M to display what they've got in, in there. Um, the last track has started to go to max content size, but once it's hit 10M, it's then started to wrap. So that's quite a useful little function to use on track sizing because you can kind of get some of the benefits of letting things be sized by content, but you're putting limits on it. So you don't say get an overflow or what have you. Um, it's worth noting these keywords aren't just defined for grid layout. It's just that they have best support in grid layout at the moment. They are defined and some of them work better than others in different browsers just for things like, you know, width or, or what have you. So actually used instead of a, a length unit. Um, so they are defined to be used all over CSS. It's just at the moment um, their best support is in grid and, and they're supported wherever grid is supported. So that's that's kind of pretty much everywhere. But these functions should be available for, for all types of, of layout. So those are those keywords. And as I say, remember, particularly min content and max content, kind of just hold that in, in your mind because it'll, it'll come in useful later, particularly when we look at Flexbox. Uh, we also have the FR unit. Now, this is specific to grid layout um, it, it, because what it does is it defines a fraction of the available space in the container. Um, it's not purely all of the space in the container. So it's not, oh, you know, the three 1FR columns will not give you essentially a third because if there's something big in one of those um, grid cells, say an, an image that couldn't, that didn't size down, that would t still take up more space. And then what was distributed would be what's left over. So it's not quite um, a fraction of the, of the whole space, it's of the available space. But most of the time, as you can see here, we do get that sort of equal looking layout. Um, and you can play around with these values. So you can say, well, I'd like my first one to have two FR and the others to have one FR each. Um, unlike using percentages, the, um, the gap is taken away before the space is distributed. So you, you, know, you don't have to kind of work out like we do when we, we use percentages for layout, um, how, much, uh, how much has to go for the gap. You can also mix FR units and um, other length units. And again, what happens is the um, sort of uh, fixed size is taken away first, and then whatever left is going to be distributed to those tracks. Um, as I mentioned, um, 1FR isn't quite um, sort of equal size tracks. Um, and there's a way of making it. So if we just if we just scrunch up this content here, you can kind of see what happens. So we're making this one so it's um, not going to break. You can see that it's what it starts to do is it starts to um, make that track larger. So they're now not nice and equal looking because the FR unit is distributing um, the available space. If you want to force that, and you absolutely want that track to be a fraction of the available space, then we can use the min max function for our track sizing. 
And you can see now that that, that string is overflowing. And it's, it's overflowing because we've said we want our tracks to be a minimum size of, of zero and a maximum of one FR. And what that's basically doing is saying these tracks have got no intrinsic size. So that min content, max content, intrinsic sizing, we're basically saying ignore that, act as if the track has nothing in it, no content, um, and then distribute everything. So 1FR is actually min max auto 1FR. It's saying look at the auto size of the track and then distribute whatever's left. If you definitely want your tracks to be absolutely, you know, sort of in this, in this case, a third of the available space in, in the container, you can use min max um, 0 1FR and that will, that will sort out the issue. Uh, the reason you might want to do that is if you're doing like a, a 12 column grid and you're going to be spanning your items over tracks, so you're going to be controlling um, how much space, um, then, then it will work. And as you say, if once you go back to broken content, um, it all just works itself out because it's then wrapping and it's, it's fitting into the track. So if we stay here um, and just look at a bit more things about doing... Um, sort of your, your track listing. Uh, if you've got, say, if you did have a 12 column grid um, and we're using things like min max, uh, that's going to start looking very verbose. So we can use repeat notation to tidy that up. So if we say repeat three and then whatever you want to repeat. And that basically means that you don't have to write out every single um, sized sort of track as you go so that could be anything um that could be you know a set of six size tracks if you wanted um anything you like and you can repeat um a single thing like this or you can repeat um a pattern in which case you'll get multiple tracks so here we'll end up with six tracks um going 200 pixels 100 pixels 200 pixels 100 pixels along until you've, you've sort of got the three sets um you can also use repeat for part of your track listing so here we might have our repeating section and then a 100 pixel track on the end um so you don't have to use it for the full thing but it's just a handy way to tidy things up really And kind of just to, to sort of uh, close the loop on stuff that you can do as you're creating your tracks, um, if we combine what we know about the FR unit, repeat and min max, we can create a very useful pattern. So if we, let's remove that. So if we say repeat auto fill 200 pixels, then what happens is grid will have as many 200 pixel columns as it can in the container. So that's quite neat, but you can see they're not flexible columns. They're kind of, they're, they're, they're fixed. We're getting 200 pixel columns, then we get a gap on the end. Um, if we say min max 200 pixels by far, then we'll get as many flexible columns as will fit with a base size of 200 pixels so they'll never get smaller than 200 pixels they're likely to get a bit bigger because of, there's that little bit extra space that's getting shared out um, and that lets you sort of create a, a, a responsive pattern really without having to use any media queries uh, because that it's, it's sort of just working out how many it can put in so that's a that's a useful little pattern and you can use that for all sorts of interesting stuff So that's sort of the basics of creating um, a grid uh, sort of very quickly. And so now we'll move on to placing things on the grid using line-based placement. So grids always have lines. Um, the lines are horizontal and vertical. As I mentioned earlier, they're indexed from one. Um, and so here I've got a grid. Um, 
we've got four columns and um, I'm using grid auto rows so that my um, tracks in the implicit grid will be a minimum of 100 pixels and a maximum of auto, which means that they'll never be smaller than 100 pixels, but they can grow to fit the context, their max is auto. And that just means that we can kind of see those tracks as we position things onto them. So I'll take my item one here. I've just popped classes on these divs just to make it, make it nice and easy. And if you want to position things using line-based positioning, we can use grid column start and grid column end to position things via columns. So let's start on line one. And end on line three. And you can see now that that item is, is stretching over a couple of tracks there. Um, those are the, the longhand properties. They're obviously fairly lengthy. Um, you've also got grid row start and grid row end if you're, if you're working by rows. Uh, you can compress that down to a shorthand if we just use grid column. And then use a forward slash and then the end line that you want to go to. So remember, you're targeting lines, not the tracks. Um, so we're going to line three because that is the line that sort of is after track two. So you, you're, you're targeting the line numbers rather than the tracks. If you want your item to start at the first line, end at the last line, you can use minus one as your last line. Because as well as counting up from one from the, the start of the, of the uh, layout, they count back from minus one from the end line. So you can target that or you could go to the second last line uh, with minus two, for example. A little note is that that only works for the explicit grid. So you can only do the, the negative line numbers um, with the grid tracks that you've defined with um, grid template columns and grid template rows. It doesn't work to go to the last line. Say if you're just filling up a grid with implicit rows, um, that way you won't be able to target the last one with minus one. Um, it is an issue that's raised that we'd quite like to be able to do that. Um, but I think it's because of the, the performance implication of laying everything out and then working out where the last line is going to be that at the moment that doesn't work. So minus one will only go to the last line of the explicit grid. So the last line of what you specify with grid template columns and grid template rows. So I say this all works in, in the same way for, for rows other than that, that sort of minus one thing. We've got implicit rows here. So we say grid row one to three. So my rows are, are getting that height because of the min max function, um, setting them to a minimum of 100 pixels just so we can kind of see where we've got those rows. So that's really the basics of um, positioning things by lines. It's very, very straightforward. Um, you give it a start line and an end line, and 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 you can position things wherever you want. Um, and you'll note that the other items just carry on laying out via the auto placement uh, mechanism, where grid finds a cell. And we'll talk a bit more about auto placement next because there's a few things that it's worth understanding about how that works. Um, Everything on top of the, the, all the other things we're going to look at for doing positioning is basically built on top of this grid of lines. Um, so you can just use line based placement and never worry about anything else if you don't want to. Um, and just use this simple go from this line to that line um, if that's if that's easier. So. So everything else is kind of a, a you know, a, a nice bit of syntax on top of this this grid of lines. Uh, it's worth noting you can overlap things. You can place things into the same cell as another thing. Um, that's fine. Um, and then if you do that, you can control that with Z-index, just like absolutely positioned items. You don't need to add position relative or anything. It, grid just works with Z-index. So if you position things into the same cell and you want to switch their order, then you can just give it a higher Z-index and that will work.
So I am kind of rattling through things today because we obviously don't have a huge amount of time. Um, and I'll try and pick up some questions at the end um, if they're not answered by future material. But, but I'm going to try and sort of get through a bunch of stuff. Um, so I want to talk a bit about auto placement because most of the questions I get that where people are a bit confused about something that Grid's doing, uh, they have something to do with auto placement. And auto placement is really powerful in Grid because it means that we can you know, create a grid and just then chuck a bunch of content at it and lay it out. And there's so many patterns on the web that are just that. You know, all these sort of card type layouts are, are literally just, here's some stuff, you know, please lay it out in, an, in a nice kind of display. So auto placement is, is what grid does when you create a grid, but you don't position any items. Um, and so if no items are positioned at all, then, you know, we just start in the top left if we're in English um, and fill up the first row and then you know carry on filling up rows which you know if you want a basic card layout that's that's kind of what you've got there but we can we can tweak this and we can sort of do some slightly different things with with auto placement so let's get um the, the the first child perhaps of here and what i'm going to say with this item is i want it to start where it would normally start which is, is going to be on line one but we'll say auto so if you use auto for a line number that's going to use its auto placement position but i'm going to say span two so you can see now that that first item has spanned two um two rows of the grid two row tracks now if we get our even items and this time i'm going to span columns there I'm saying start where you would normally start where auto placement would put you but span over two column tracks so this is kind of a useful pattern you know you could be targeting these items anywhere you like um, for example you could have a, a bunch of images and some of them are portrait and some of them are landscape and you want the landscape ones to span two tracks so you could maybe have a class on the ones that have landscape images and target it that way um, you'll notice that there are gaps in the grid when we do this. And so by default, what grid layout is doing is it is keeping things in source order. So if you look at the source here and I've numbered the items, it makes it easy. We've got one, two, three. There's not enough space here for four to fit. So it's just gone down to the next line. And then we've got five. You can modify that behavior with grid auto flow set to dense. And so you can see what's happened there is that uh, item number five has kind of hopped up and filled that gap. So what that does is it kind of takes things out of source order. And if you think about accessibility, that could potentially be a bit of a problem. Um, if, you, if these were, say, product cards and someone was tabbing through them, then you could end up with a rather confusing sort of behavior where you're sort of jumping around uh, the screen. So generally, you need to be very, very careful um, when messing around with things like grid auto flow and dense packing. Uh, but even just with, you know, with positioning things by lines or what have you, if you start to take things away from the order that they are in the source, you can end up creating a very confusing experience for people. Because there's an awful lot of people who maybe use a screen reader, but also can see the content on, on the screen, um, or are, are using the keyboard completely to navigate. Um, and, and in that situation, you can sort of create an odd experience. The way to test it um, is a lot of dev tools now have got um, the ability to check that the, sort of the tab order through, through a document. Um, and the other thing is just to keyboard navigate yourself, you know, put your mouse away, put your trackpad away and use your keyboard to get around your site and make sure that that does make sense. 
um, because for a screen reader user, they're going to have things read out to them in source order. So the, the biggest issue is people who are, you know, accessing the, accessing the document and can also see the layout because it can be very, very disconnecting um, if, if you uh, mess things around. So that's just a general warning with, with grid and lessly flex box. And I mean, you can do it with anything. You could do it with absolute positioning as well. You could cause a mess, but because we don't tend to lay out our entire layouts with absolute positioning, it, it's not been as much of a problem as it is now. And I have a second auto placement example just because I wanted to highlight something which tends to come up as an issue. So I've got some items here which um, are um, positioned on, on my grid here. And they've all got some sort of placement, which is why they're like this. And so we've got bits of white space um, where there isn't an item. I add another item. It shows up um, right up here in that bit of white space that we'd left. Um, and that typically is quite confusing when it happens because you kind of expect the auto placement will start after all of the items that you've placed. If you mix auto placement and line based positioning um, and so an, an auto placed item appears it will go into the first available cell for it so when this causes people problems is they've made a grid on their body element and then so and, and they've got some white space in that as part of their layout and then something gets injected in or someone puts something in with a cms or whatever um, and it appears in a really weird place and they can't understand why it got there it's this is going on. You've got a lot of positioned items. You've just put something in and it's appeared in an odd place. Um, catches everybody out. Caught me out the other day. I was building an example that just happened to use grid. Um, I was, you know, demonstrating something else. And I'm like, why is that? Where is that thing coming from and, and why? And it was because it, it was something which I hadn't placed. And so it was it sort of popped up into an odd place. So generally, if you're using auto placement, use auto placement. If you're positioning items, you probably want to position all of your items um, because otherwise you are going to get a, a slightly odd, odd effect um, it, like this. Uh, and if something does appear in an odd place in your grid layout, you can be pretty sure that's what's going on. You've got something which hasn't got a position on your grid. So let's look at number five, which is named lines. So I really just wanted to sort of show you an example of, of naming lines on on the grid because um, it's a sort of a, a slightly unusual syntax um, and so this example I've, I've got some regular line based position things but I've also added some named lines um, to sort of show you that so you name lines on your grid um, by using um, a name within square brackets like this uh, which is a slightly sort of unusual syntax. Um, the name can be pretty much anything you want um, other than keywords that we use in grid layout. So you couldn't use, say, span um, as, as a name, but otherwise you can use pretty much anything you like. So you name your lines in the position where that line is. So this main start is essentially line one, which means that our item one, which starts at main start and finishes at main end, that's basically like doing one minus one because I've got main end at the end of the grid. You totally don't have to use named lines. Um, as you can see, I've mixed it here with, with using line numbers. There's kind of a, a sort of reasons why you might want to do it. I mean, it might be easier for other team members. You know, if you name the lines on your grid, 
um, and then they can just position things against them. You can have multiple line names if you want. So, for example, we could also have, um, you know, call start and call end in here. So you can have multiple lines. You just need to separate them with a with a space, and then you could use either of those line names to target that line. So you might want to do that just to make it easier for the people to work with your grid. Um, if you are redefining this grid within media queries, then if you're careful with naming lines, naming specific lines, you could, for instance, always have content against line content, even if line content was, you know, line two in one context and line one in another. So you can kind of use it that way to, to help make it easier to do a responsive layout and not need to keep track of which line things are positioned against. So that's... Uh, that's kind of useful. The um, the convention is to use this dash start dash end for your start and end lines, which gives a little bit of extra functionality that we'll we'll look at later. But uh, you don't need to. So you could call them A, B, C, and D if you wanted. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. You can call them anything you want. But this is a convention, so you'll you'll often see people with this sort of name dash start and end in their named lines. Let's say you. Um, you absolutely don't need to use it. Um, I don't see it used that often. I think people, it, it's not so common used, but it's sort of, I think a lot of things in grid layout, it's just like, it's worth knowing that you can do it because it might come in useful later on. So you sort of just know that you can. Um, I don't have time to go into it too much today, but you can have multiple lines with the same name, in which case they act like an index of those lines. So if you named every other line, um, you know, a name, say call or whatever, um, and then you you targeted call two, that would get the second line that was named call. So again, that's a useful possibility. It allow, allows you to sort of target a set of lines um, in, in, rather than targeting the whole grid. Um, so that's just, yeah, something handy to know that, that you can work with. But probably more likely what you're going to want to use is the, the concept of named grid areas. Because I think this is my favorite thing about the grid. Because this gives us a different way to lay out our items. So what we do with grid template areas is we define in CSS what our layout looks like um, as the value of the grid template areas property. So this is my container, and I've got my four column grid here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use grid template areas. And we're going to just do a bit of ASCII art here. which is defining each row of the layout. Each row is, is between the quotes. That's not going to do anything exciting just yet. But then if we go down to our items, which have each again got a class on them, we can then place them on the grid using the grid area property. So basically putting each of these items into a position on the grid. So I've used the names that I defined up here, and I've given each of my items um, a grid area. So that's the area that it's going to sit in. So as you can see, a repeated name um, causes the item to span tracks. Um, and we've sort of got these different rectangular areas. They have to be rectangular areas. You can't create like an L-shaped piece or something like that. We can't do any kind of Tetris 
within our ASCII art at the moment. Um, and you have to have a complete grid. So you can see we've actually filled every cell of the grid. Now that doesn't mean you can't have white space. If you want to have white space, then you can just use a dot. And you can actually use a string of dots, so that will help your ASCII art line up, which I think is quite nice. Um, you can also have multiple white spaces in between things. So if you had different different lengths of names, um, then you can use multiple spaces to get it all line up. Um, so a dot will give you white space. I mean, if you kind of say if you don't have a complete grid or you use a T-shaped area or something like that, then essentially the whole value will, will be seen as invalid and, and be thrown away and you won't get a layout. So you kind of have to use use it as you want. But the, the nice thing about this, it's so easy to play around with your layout here. Um, you know, if I want to see what my a sidebar looks like, if it spans um, two rows, I can just do that. Uh, so it's a very nice way to sort of play around and experiment with layout. Um, and it's also very easy to redefine, as you can imagine, inside your media queries, because you can just, if you've named everything, you can just redefine grid template areas um, to move from a two to a four column layout or what have you. Um, I also think it's just really nice, uh, particularly if you're working in a kind of component based system. Um, so you've got all of your components and their CSS. You can see what that looks like looking at the CSS, which I think is just a really nice thing, because that's something that CSS doesn't really do very well. Um, it's very, very difficult to kind of look at some CSS and, and figure out what on earth it's doing um, in, in terms of the actual layout. Whereas, you know, with this, you can actually see right there in, in that container what its layout looks like, um, which I think is it's kind of just a really nice thing and, and an unusual thing for CSS. So if you think about our layout methods of the past using floats or something, I mean, I mean, you absolutely have no idea what's going on unless you poke around in DevTools. So I think it's actually very nice to, to be able to see that. So yeah, I use this all the time. I, I, I love it. Um, before Grid was even really a thing, um, I started using this for prototyping just because it's so easy to, to mess about in code with, with your layouts. It's, um, I was using it behind a flag. To, to prototype stuff because it, it's a nice thing to use. So have a quick look at something that you get when you use grid areas, which is this grid lines from um, named areas. So we're basically going back to a, a similar sort of um, layout here. But I've got an extra item at the bottom, which is being placed by auto placement. So again, if you've got something laid out with, with good template areas, auto-placed items are just going to end up um, below. Now, I mentioned with line-based positioning that you can position items onto the grid um, using lines. So you can, you can combine um, grid template areas with line-based positioning if you want. So we've got our item here, and I could layer that onto the grid, say grid column one and grid row so that's gonna sort of dump it layer it on top and again that would be that would be sort of controllable with z index you've got your box there um you can also though place it by using line names and the line names are generated from the names that you've given the different areas on your grid so we could also position this with SD start and SD start, and it's against the footer, isn't it? So FT end. But this is like using your line base, your, your named line placement, but the named lines are being generated by the names that we gave our areas with dash start and dash end um, appended. So both for rows and columns, so, so for the area HD, we're going to have HD start at the top, HD start at the bottom, so that's for rows. And for columns, we've got HD start um, on the left, because we're in English, and HD end on the right. Um, so you can actually use those to place an item 
into that layout um, and lay and sort of and, and to layer things over. I mean, for example, you might want to put a close button if this was a, a little dialogue panel or something. You might want to put a close button top right. Well, you could you could use the the lines to know that you're always targeting that top right area without having to use line numbers, which might change in a responsive layout if you're changing the number of of uh, column tracks. So again, that's a handy little thing, um, which I don't see people use very often. But again, it's a, a kind of just a useful little bit of functionality um, that you might find handy. One day it'll solve a problem. So it's sort of handy to know you can do that. So then we'll have a look at alignment on the grid. So when we're sort of looking at all these demos, um, and I think with a lot of, of grid demos, you know, we see this, we see these sort of full height columns and content which is stretched all the way over each grid cell or, or grid area. Now the reason they're doing that is because the alignment properties by default stretch over the full area that an item is in. So if you've got a background color on it, it fills the entire area. Um, it's quite nice. We we spent a long time on the web battling to have full height columns, and the default for both Grid and Flexbox is you get full height columns. Um, the only time that doesn't happen is if your item has an aspect ratio. So that would be something like an image, um, images um, or video, anything with an aspect ratio will be aligned to start um, both for rows and columns rather than stretch. So we don't stretch your images by default. Um, if you want to stretch your image, if your image is a grid item and you want to stretch it, you absolutely can. But by default, we won't do that um, because that would kind of, well, generally you don't want to stretch your images out of shape. Um, so all of the alignment properties are detailed in the box alignment specification. If you learned Flexbox, when Flexbox first came out, you might think of them as really being tied to Flexbox because they started with that spec, but they then got themselves moved out so that we could do alignment anywhere. Um, in, in the same kind of way. So when we talk about alignment, everybody's first question is, I can never remember how whether I should be using align or justify. Um, so I'll try and explain when you should use align and justify. So in grid, and we'll look at Flexbox later, but in grid, um, you use the properties that begin with align on the block axis. So if we're in English, um, which is a horizontal writing mode. The block axis is the, the going from top to bottom. Um, and it's the, the axis of which our blocks lay out one after the other. So on that axis, we're going to use the properties that start with align. So that's align content, align items, align self. Now align content controls the distribution of space between the tracks. So in this case, my grid is defined by that this sort of gray border. And so I've got some extra space. And I've got extra space because I'm using pixels for my track sizing. So I'm not using a, a sizing that will let them stretch to fill the, the remaining space. Um, so that means that I can do something with that spare space. So I could say align content space between. Oh, and it helps if you spell correctly. So what's happened there is that the spare space um, in the block direction has been put between the items. And you'll see that the um, these items here have got bigger, and that's because they've got a gap. And so they're getting some extra space um, put into that gap. And because they span over it, uh, that means they also get bigger. So that's something to be aware of with grid, um, that obviously you're going to get space between tracks that might have things um, uh, sort of sp uh, spanning over them. Um, and so you could, so could centre it on this axis. Centre. So it's very much like the, the properties we used to in Flexbox, uh, the, same, the same sort of values you can use. Um, so that's distributing the spare space. So the other thing you want to do is align the actual items themselves. So they're stretched by default. Uh, and so you can use align items.
And so now instead of stretching on the block axis to give us our full height columns, it's just they've just aligned up to the start of that item. And we could use end, it all goes down to the end. And what align items does is it sets all of the align self properties. So we can do those on an individual basis. You could say align self um, center. That gets my first item and aligns it to the center. So we're basically just shifting things up and down there on the block axis. So you can then on the inline axis do exactly the same, but using justify. So if we say justify content center, that moves all of the tracks there into the center. Or we could say justify content end, and that moves all of the tracks to the end. So we're now working in the inline direction. So here we're working sort of left and right in, in English. Um, and we can justify items. And so that's now justifying the item to the end of its area. And again, we've got the self property. So we can say justify self and target one of them. Well, let's get that one we had before and say center to it. That's moved that one to the center. So you can see once you start doing that, things can stop looking like a grid. And this is where your sort of ability to layer things sort of works because you might have an item which is stretched all the way over an area. You position another item into that same area and then align it so that it goes to the top right, for example, like a close button. Um, and this kind of means you don't necessarily have to use so much like absolute positioning for those things, um, which can be a little bit fragile. You can actually use grid itself to to move things around. Um, so that's the line. But you kind of have to play around with them to get used to using them. I think people you know, find them quite confusing. Um, Dev tools are really handy because you can kind of see where you're moving things around. You know, look at the grid in Dev tools and um, and just play around with them until you get the idea. But in grid, it's fairly straightforward. You've got two dimensions. You've got block and in line. If you want to move things on the block axis, the properties begin with that line. If you want to move them on the inline axis, you're going to use the properties that begin with justify. And you've got two different things to deal with. You've got the space around tracks, which only works if you've got extra space. And then you've got the item inside its area to, to sort of move about. Um, and by combining those, you can do all sorts of interesting things. So moving swiftly on, um, something that I think is quite useful I wanted to wrap up the grid stuff with is using generated content with grid layout. Because I think this lets you do all sorts of interesting things. Again, it's solving problems that people say, oh, you know, how do I do this with grid? Uh, one of the things we can't do at the moment is style a grid area without putting something into it. So you have to have you know, some HTML element in there in order to give it a border, for example. Um, we're looking at ways to change that in the CSS working group to give people a, a way to to style um, the sort of the the gap, as it were. Um, but at the moment, that isn't possible. But you can do quite a bit of it by using generated content because it works really nicely with Grid. So, just as a quick demo of that, if I say container before. And we're just putting in an empty string of generated content. And we'll give it a background color so we can see it. You see there, we've got essentially a new grid item. And so the generated content works in exactly the same way as any other grid item. When you say before with generated content, what it does is it adds a first child. Um, it's a little bit misleading, because you're sort of saying container before. You feel like that should be before the container, but it's not. It's actually before the content of the container. So that's what you get. And you've also got after. So I'm just going to copy that. And if you use after, that will give you
the last child essentially so it'll put in a piece of generated content um, as the last child of your container um, so you've kind of got these two extra elements that you can play with by using generated content um, which can be quite useful you can use them to because obviously you can position those you can use line based positioning on them you can style them up anywhere you want you can use them to create borders on areas or you can use them for you know little stylistic touches um, I have a sort of non-obvious use for this, which I like to do. So let's quickly do that. So if I had a heading up here, into my HTML, and then I'm going to say, I'm going to use generated content before and after the heading. Um, and then I'm going to give it a border. And align it. And then I go to my H1. They display I'm basically creating a three column grid and I'm going to give it a gap. So what that's giving me is nice flexible um, uh, sort of lines either side of my heading. Um, there's a ton of patterns like this. Uh, the nice thing about this, I think it, this sort of demonstrates a couple of things that I like to show people with grid. You don't just need to use grid for like your main page layout. You can use it on components as well. Um, you know, I, I quite often turn, um, you know, little components into a grid just so I can do this sort of thing. I can, I can s somehow style it up. Um, a lot of what I did before, before I was at Google, you know, one of the things I did was I had a CMS product. So I did lots and lots of um, kind of UI, little bits of user interface. Um, and Grid's really useful for that stuff. If you get away from thinking of it as just for your main layout. Um, and yeah, there's, there's tons of little things where you're just like, oh, I just want to be able to have a nice, you know, little stylistic um, line or something. So this is quite a useful, useful pattern. Um, and it works because basically we're saying, that center track, which is where the heading text ends up, is auto-sized, so will be big enough to fit the contents we talked about before. Either side, we've got a 1FR track, and so they will just take up as much space um, as they need, um, and so it'll be nice and, nice and flexible. And if the heading gets bigger, those lines will just get smaller because they're, they're only going to take up the space they want. So that's kind of just a, a useful little um, tip. And just to have you think about grid, you know, outside of big grids and page layouts and so on um you know the the sort of intrinsic sizing and generated content and just thinking of interesting ways to to lay things out it can be actually quite useful for so we've got half an hour left to go and i want to go through flexbox a little bit um and the reason I, I sort of do grid first, I think grid is actually easier to understand in a lot of ways than Flexbox because Flexbox is kind of a bit weird. Um, <laughs> and I think we, we sort of see it as being a bit weird because when it first showed up, we thought, um, oh, we'll use, we'll use Flexbox to do grid layouts because it's better than floats, which is true. Um, it would have found it difficult to be worse than floats for layout. Um, but it wasn't ever really designed for doing uh, grid layouts um, because what Flexbox is designed for is taking a bunch of oddly sized things and returning the best layout for those things which is also something that is impossible to do with floats really you know it's very very difficult you have to kind of give things percentage sizes and, and push them around with floats so I think it's time now to think about Flexbox more for what it was designed for um, so that's really what we're sort of gonna gonna look at here so again 
it's a value of display. So we say display flex, and we immediately get a bunch of flexbox behavior. I mean, that might be all you want to do. It's, it's really useful. Um, the items display as a row. They line up at the start, and they don't grow to fill the container. Uh, what they actually do is go to max content size if they can. So um, they display as a row because the initial value of flex direction is row. And of course, with flexbox, we can play around with the direction the main axis. So the flex direction property changes your main axis. And we can also do things like reverse the flow of that main axis, which sort of switches the start and end. Um, just like with dense packing in grid, um, don't do this if your problem is that you've got your items in the wrong order. Uh, change your HTML. Because just like with grid, the navigation order, the tab order of the content is going to be what your HTML is. So if you start switching things around, you're probably going to cause people problems. Um, where you're not going to cause problems, and you know there is reasons you might want to use it, say you've got like an icon and, and a field or something, and, and they're not targetable, you know, the icon's not targetable, and you just want it to be on the other side of the field, that's probably a reasonable use of doing row reverse. You probably get away with that. But again, test it. If you're doing that stuff, um, when I used to do sort of audits of people's CSS, this would be the sort of thing I would look for is the use of row or column reverse or the order property in Flexbox. Um, you know, if I found those, that would be a little bit of a red flag that, you know, have we jumbled stuff up? And it's not always, you know, as I say, people can use them well. But that's just something to kind of be, be aware of. Um, check your tab order. Make sure that you're not creating a mess for somebody. Um, Flexbox, again, works with um, the writing mode of the document. So if we happen to be using Arabic, uh, the items would start on the right and flow um, over to the left because it, it goes with the document flow. Um, and that's common with, as I say, Grid and Flexbox. Uh, we're designed once we would kind of realize that people don't just use English on the web. And so they've been designed for that reality. Um, and, and so, which is why we don't tend to talk about let, top, right, bottom, left, like we do in other places in CSS. We work with um, the sort of the logical flow relative directions. So the other thing to sort of just remember with Flexbox is rather than thinking about block and inline, because we can do this thing of changing the, the main axis, um, you tend to want to think about the main axis and the cross axis when you're doing stuff in Flexbox. So the main axis is whatever you've set flex direction to, or by default row, if you've not got a flex direction property. And the cross axis is running across that. So if, you're, if your main axis is row, then your cross axis is, is the column. And so let's have a look at number two, which is wrapping flex items. So Flexbox is designed essentially to be a one-dimensional layout method. And what that means is you're controlling the row or the column, but not both at once. Now, you can obviously get um, multi-line flex containers. Um, so we do that if we've got our, our container here and we say display flex. And the, the items have sort of they've sort of gone into the, these columns here. Now, if we want them to wrap, we can use flex wrap. And what that will do by default is just wrap them all onto individual lines, which probably wasn't what you wanted. Um, so we'll look at the flex property later, but I'm just going to have a flex basis of 300 pixels, which basically says, you know, I, I don't want to be smaller than 300 pixels. So they end up wrapping onto two lines there. Um, and you can see really here, this is the difference between grid and flexbox. Uh, if you were in grid layout, then item four and five would be lined up underneath item one and two, and you'd have a gap at the end. Because we're in flexbox, the space distribution happens on a flex line by line basis. So, and that's really what we mean by one dimensional. Even though we've got, you know, two rows here, each of those rows is treated like an individual flex container. 
so space distribution happens just across the row this row down here doesn't know about this one really so it, it doesn't know to line up things um, now obviously if you wanted to create a flexbox grid and lots of people have created a flexbox grid the way you do that is by turning off the flexibility of flexbox stopping this growing behavior um, and then sizing things in percentages again just like you did with the floated layout so it kind of becomes like floats plus um, so when you do a flexbox grid you're essentially fighting against the natural way that flexbox behaves which is why then flexbox seems a bit weird and hard um, because you're actually trying to sort of force it into this this sort of grid um, layout which it doesn't really suit um, so if 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 you end up the layout like this and you're like actually I want these item four and five to line up under item one and two uh, switch layout methods say display grid create some columns you know maybe use the auto fill method that I showed you before um, and use a grid layout for that component they're very easy to switch um, and there's no tax in switching layout methods. You know, you don't have to worry about whether you're using grid or flexbox. Use the one that suits the pattern that you're trying to build uh, is, is really the key thing to remember. So let's look at alignment in flexbox. Now, I think alignment is harder to understand in flexbox, and I think it's why people often find alignment quite confusing because we've got this switchable axis. Um, we can't just say block or inline. Um, we're actually saying, well, you know, what's the what's the main axis? So in Flexbox, when you're doing alignment, you need to think about the main axis. And the main axis is the one that you use for flex direction. And on that axis, you're treating the items as a group. So you're sort of moving the items around um, as a group of items rather than as individual items. Um, so we can have a look at that. Um, so we use the on, on the main axis, we use the justify property. Um, so we can say justify content space between. And again, just like between grid tracks, what we're doing here is we're taking the extra space and we're sharing it out between the items. Um, if we say justify content flex end and we take our available space and we dump it before the items uh, so this will only work if you've got spare space in your um, in your in your flex line if you've got you know if your items are all packed in and there's no extra space then justify content won't do anything um, because it's it's it needs the the extra space to to share out. Um, so there's no self property when you're on the main axis because you're dealing with these items as a group of items and you're just sharing out space around them. If you want to do a sort of pattern, and you know, it's a sort of fairly common pattern where you've got, like particularly on navigation, you've got sort of two groups of navigation and you've got one lot pushed over to the left and one lot pushed over to the right. Um, the way you do that in Flexbox, and it's in the spec, because this is what we should be doing, is we use auto margins. So I've just added a class to number five there to make it nice and easy. If we say push, and if we say margin left auto, and that basically pushes the item over to the right. Uh, the reason that works is that auto margins absorb all of the space in their direction. Um, so it's how you center a block. I'm sure, you know, if you've ever done a, you've done a fixed width or sort of a, a percentage width layout and you've done margin left and right auto and then the layout has gone to the middle, that's because you've got two margins that are both trying to get all possible space and that's just shoving the thing into the center. If you give a flex item an auto margin, it will take all of the space. And so you get that, that separation. So obviously you could put that class wherever you wanted or you could target something with the last child or what have you. Um, so if you're wondering how to deal, you know, to, to deal with one item differently or a group of items differently on the main axis, auto margins are the way to do that. Um, so that's sort of the, the sort of basics of, of doing that. Um, we also have obviously the ability to use um, the alignment on the, on the cross axis. So 
in this case that's on, on the block axis so that's aligning things against each other um, we've got a couple of things we might want to do there let's just tidy this up so we can the first of those is if you've got wrapped flex lines and spare space in the container um, on the cross axis, you can use a line content to deal with that space in the same way that you use justify content. So if I give my container um, a block size or some height, now you can see that the items have, have stretched themselves. Um, and I am going to say, wrap them. Uh, oh, it's in the wrong place. <laughs> we go. We put flex wrap on the on the parent. There we go. So we've got items here which are wrapped, um, and we've got spare space. You can see they're stretching to fill all the spare space. Um, so we can then use align content um, to distribute that space. Um, So I've got a line, I've got to basically put the space between. Um, probably you're less likely to be using a line content, um, but it does work in the same way if you happen to have extra space and your um, multiple lines. And then we also have a line items and a line self um, on the cross axis. So just like in grid, uh, we can use align items, um, say start. That's going to align them to the start. Or we can align them to the center. Now, in this case, we've got a, a sort of a height of block size on the container. Um, if we didn't have that and they're all the same sort of size, then obviously that's, that's not going to do anything because they've got nowhere to align. However, if we say added some extra text into one of these to make one of them taller, you can kind of see there now how the other items are central aligned against that one. Um, and just as with, um, with grid, these are setting the, the self properties so if we go for that one I've decided a class two so that one's five and we could say align self and that one's now aligned itself to the end um, so again this gives you quite a lot of ability to to play around with alignment um, really useful for again small UI components where you're wanting to you know you've got like a label and a form field and some little icon um, quite often, just um, aligning items to center will just line them all up for you nicely. Uh, things that were just a real pain in the past. Um, so quite often, you know, using Flexbox for those little alignment tasks, uh, you know, it's it's really handy. Uh, and that really comes to to this uh, this demo here. One of the very useful things about Flexbox is it allows us to properly center items, which apparently is one of the hardest things in web development. Um, to do that, we've got we've got a container here with an item here that we would like to center. I'm going to make it a flex container. It gives me access to the alignment properties. So I can then um, put it into the center, um, and make me, meaning that uh, problem is now solved. Um, in the future, at some point, uh, we might be able to do this without using Display Flex. The alignment properties are specified for block layout, so just your normal flow, your regular layout um, of things when they're not flex or grid. Um, at the moment, no browser has actually implemented this because messing around with block and inline layout is obviously quite scary. Um, so it's kind of going to be something that 
that is is coming. I think it's probably something that that people will look at. Um, but there really is no tax in turning a container into a flex container just to do alignment. Um, so if all you want to do is is align the things well, that's absolutely fine. Um, you can you know make it a flex container, then you've got access to the alignment properties for whatever's inside the container to do your alignment. Um, but yeah, at some point in the future, we'll be able to use um, the alignment properties outside of Grid and Flexbox just to to align something um, in, in inside another box. And I think Flexbox is quite useful in that regard because it shows you that actually where you've got the alignment properties, you won't necessarily have all of the alignment properties. You know, in, in Flexbox, we don't have all of the properties on the on the main axis because we're dealing with things as a group. And it'll be the same with block layout. Uh, not all of the alignment properties are going to make sense in a block layout context. So it'll just be the ones that, that do make sense will be the ones you have access to. But yeah, you know, feel free to make things flex containers in order to align the stuff inside them. Um, and it ends again. It's nice that the uh, the age old problem of not being able to properly center things has has been solved for us. So really just to finish off, I wanted to look at the the actual flex property itself uh, very quickly. And so really, what we've looked at so far with alignment is distributing space um, around the items. So you've got some spare space in your container, and we're going to sort of move the items around by messing about with that space. But you might actually want the space to go inside the items themselves. Um, so I've got my items here, and one of the items has got a lot more content. And you can see here that the default behavior of Flexbox is for the items to go to max content. So when we looked at max content with Grid, and we saw how a max content item goes as big as it can, um, but no bigger, and you can see that that's happening with these items. Um, and Flexbox will do that. It will go to max content if it can. And as long as your items are allowed to shrink, which they are by default, um, once there's not enough room for them to go to max content, they'll start to shrink down um, into so that they fit into the space and they'll they'll shrink down till they go to min content. Um, and, so, and so that's kind of the default behavior of Flexbox. And that's controlled by the flex properties. Um, and the initial values of the flex properties are flex grow is zero, flex shrink is one, and flex basis is auto. And we tend to use the shorthand. So grow, shrink, auto. So flex grow is zero. The items don't grow. And you can see that because they've only gone to max content. They haven't filled the container. Um, flex shrink is one. They can shrink. And we saw that when we made the container smaller, they shrunk. And the flex spaces is auto, which again, big enough to fit the content, kind of intrinsic sizing. Uh, the flex algorithm will treat that as going to max content if it can, if not sort of shrinking down. Um, so that's sort of the basics of of using um, the flex properties there. So obviously we can we can play around with those a bit. Uh, if you do want the items to grow, we could say flex one, and you can see now that the items have grown and they've filled the container, uh, but they haven't they haven't gone to like equal sizes. It's because it's a bit like the FR unit in Grid. You're sort of sharing out whatever's left of um in the space um accord from the from the auto basis because that's our flex basis if you would like the items to all end up equal we could change auto to zero and again just like that fr unit we're saying here the items have got no intrinsic size give them a flex basis of zero and you get the sort of equally sized um items so that's really the sort of two things you might want to sort of understand about flex basis. You can give a flex basis of a, a length unit, which is what we were doing to force things to wrap. Um, if you want items to, say, grow from 200 pixels, so they're never going to get smaller than 200 pixels, and then they're going to wrap onto another line, you might want to give a larger flex basis. Um, but most of the time with Flexbox, you can use sort of these default values for the flex properties. You don't even need to remember flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. You can remember the these sort of default shorthands. Um, so those are flex initial. That's your initial 
Um, fact, you probably wouldn't need to set this unless you were setting it back to it for some reason, um, because this is just the initial values. So the things um, can, um, they, they do shrink, they don't grow, um, and their flex basis is auto. If you say flex auto, that gives you shrinking. So flex shrink is one, uh, flex grow is one, so the items can grow and their flex basis is auto. If you say flex none, you get fully inflexible flex items. So their flex shrink value is set to zero. They're not allowed to shrink. Um, you might want to do this if you are just using Flexbox for the alignment properties. You're saying display flex because you want to turn on the ability to use the alignment properties, but you don't want any other flexible behavior to start happening. You might want to use Flex1. That might solve your problem. I don't think I've ever used it in production, but it's there if you need to use it. Um, and then the other thing is to use, and this is what all the tutorials did when Flexbox first came out and confused everybody. Flex1 um, is basically setting the Flex Grow um, to zero, and uh, the, the Flex Basis to zero, and Flex Grow to whatever you put here. So if we have an item our class, and if we say because the flex uh, basis is zero, um, item five with our class of five and which has flex two is going to be two times the size of the other items because you're basically setting the, the flex growth factor to being um, two rather than one. The others have all got one. Um, so when you use flex one, two, whatever, you're setting the flex basis to zero. So you get that consistent, um, you know, sharing out of, of, of content. Um, whereas if you use flex auto, which is the default, then Flexbox looks at the max content size and the min content size and figures out, you know, how much um, space to give each of the items. Um, which I think is kind of the killer feature of Flexbox. It's kind of what it's for. That ability to just say, hey, browser, here's this bunch of things. Please give them a reasonable layout. Don't squash a big thing into a tiny box or leave loads of space around um, this small thing. Um, and so really, sort of, you're kind of tweaking that layout basically when you're using Flexbox. Um, and I think if you are doing something like setting widths on all of your Flex items, or setting a specific flex basis, you know, you're doing lots of classes to target individual items, you're probably going to have an easier time using grid. And you don't need to think of grid as just being um, just just being for like, you know, two dimensional things. You can use grid like I did for the heading for a one dimensional thing, just because it gives you access to a bunch of stuff. Um, so I think if I was to leave you with anything, it's to think of these layout methods as giving you access to a bunch of interesting things um, that you can then do with them, rather than thinking of them strictly as, you know, grid is for sort of macro layouts and, and flex boxes for little UI elements, you know? Use whichever one works the best. Use whichever one gives you the access to the tools that you need to create the patterns that you want. Um, and don't be afraid to play around and switch what you're doing if, if it's not working out. See if the other one will work better for you. Um, so that's kind of what I've got for you today. I know it has been um, a super fly through all of this stuff. Um, I hope some of that's been handy and that you learned little bits and pieces that maybe you didn't know before. Um, the, the Discord channel is open, I think, until the, the end of, maybe the end of the month. Or the, so the, there is a CSS channel there. I know that I, I've been in there and Uno and Adam from Google have been in there as well talking about layout stuff. So you're always very welcome to go and ask questions there maybe that are a little bit more complex than, than some of the stuff we've covered here please use that you know take advantage of of the the knowledge that that we've got here and, and that we're sharing um, and i'll have a quick look through um questions and see if there's anything that i can quickly answer um, let's just scroll up to the top here Um, right, so there was someone here says, um, named lines, is there a best practice to use areas versus line numbers? It is absolutely up to you. Um, 
So basically, the CSS Working Group makes CSS and we create things that we think will solve a wide variety of use cases. But um, other than the occasional accessibility tip, um, there's not really a good or bad practice here. Um, it's very much what you want to be doing. What I would say, and having looked at quite a lot of people's CSS over the years, um, choose something and use that. Decide on how you're going to use something like Grid. Because what you don't want is you know, some people on your team using Grid template areas, some people naming lines, and then everyone's using something different, you're going to end up with a mess. So I think defining what you want to use is the important thing. Um, there's no real difference um, in terms of performance or anything else, which ones. There's no good or bad practice. It's more you know, what works well for your team. Um, so we've got a question about IE not supporting Grid. If you're still having to support IE at this point, I'm really sorry for you. I know some people do need to support IE. Um, Feature queries, I think somebody else in the chat mentioned, you can use, you know, at supports, you use at supports display grid. You can create a simpler layout for um, IE browsers um, and then use grid layout as a progressive enhancement. Um, I mean, hopefully you're not having to build new things right now for, for, for IE. Um, it is kind of going away. Um, and all, you know, all modern browsers support, all the stuff I've shown today has you know, fantastic browser support. You know, none of this stuff is is cutting edge at this point. Um, IE really is people who've got to support IE. You know, I, I know I know some people are still having to support IE, um, and it's it, it's it's an unfortunate thing. Um, but feature queries are probably the best way to to deal with that if you're wanting to introduce components laid out with Grid into something which has to support IE. Because remember that support is. Support isn't looks the same. And I think if you're dealing with Internet Explorer at this point, then there is so much. People using Internet Explorer are going to be seeing such a mess on the web. They're going to be very happy if they can just read your content and, and you know, you're not doing anything that makes it hard for them to use. So I think that, you know, use, giving them a simpler layout and then using feature queries to enhance that layout is probably a good way forward. Um, and if you are just adding things into um, a layout that needs support, i.e., that's probably the way to go. Um, and yeah, you know, feature queries are really for anything new that appears on the web now. You can use feature queries to detect it and to to provide fallbacks um, if if it's going to be a problem. And we are really up on time. As I say, if you've got specific questions, you've got a bit of code you want me to look at, um, do stick them into the Discord. As I say. Um, we got had quite a nice chat in there after the, the last workshop. So, you know, do use that. And as I say, I'm not the only person who has, has got knowledge on, on CSS answering there. You know, Una and Adam have, have got a ton of knowledge on, on creating cool stuff. So, so do come and use the Discord. I hope this has been handy. Um, I'm Rachel Andrew. I'm at Rachel Andrew on Twitter. If you want to follow me there, I, I do talk about CSS stuff as well as cats. Um, so you can follow me there. And, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope this has been handy for you. Thank you.